Hello and welcome to episode 46 of the Carry On With Carrie podcast. Today, I am thrilled to introduce you to Janelle Schultz. Janelle is a registered provisional psychologist with Emerling Psychology and the Bridge Sports Therapy and Training. Janelle specializes in men's mental health, sports psychology, and also enjoys working with couples. After decades of working primarily with women, she made a midlife career shift into psychology, where she realized the crisis that is facing men's mental health today. This sparked an interest in supporting men to become more emotionally attuned, improve relationship skills, and become their ideal selves. Janelle is also an ultra runner, race director for a local charity race, parent of three teens, and a proud puppy mama. And without further ado, now it's time to talk. Okay. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 46 of the Carry On With Carrie podcast. Today I am thrilled to introduce you to Janelle Schultz. She is a registered provisional psychologist with Emerling Psychology and the Bridge Sports Therapy and Training. Janelle specializes in mental health. <laughs> I do specialize in mental health, you're right. <laughs> I'll do the intro after, so we're good. Let's just get going. Okay. <laughs> I'll do it like I usually do. I'll do it after because I do that, right? Okay. You're overthinking it. I really we're am. both overthinking yes. it. Yeah, that's right. Just go. Okay. So, hello and welcome to the show. Hi, Carrie. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here today. Yeah, it's it's um, we've had a bit of back and forth, mm-hmm. and we've been communicating for a little bit, and it's finally nice to it's nice to finally meet you. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, I as a can you explain it to us? <laughs> what would you like me to explain? <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about yourself, your personal or professional experience with mental health and how it's affected you or inspired you in your life. Yeah. Uh, like everybody out there, of course, I have been impacted by mental health. There's there's no escaping it. It's part of who we are. It's, it's just a part of being human. And I think like a lot of people spent, um, you know, the early part of my years not really understanding it and not understanding the impact that mental health had when it comes to overall health. So I did make the shift into working specifically in mental health as a psychologist uh, quite late in life. Mm -hmm. Um, I spent years, uh, decades (laughs) working in the nonprofit sector in Edmonton and I did a lot with working with women. I worked with teen parents. I worked with um, parents as, so mostly women as primary caregivers of young children. I did a lot to support families sort of in in that world. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, around COVID, you know, a lot of people had things really shake up and I was one of those people. And so um, went through some of my own challenges and um, just decided it was time to to try something different or to take my career in a different direction sort of an extension of what I had been doing. So I um, got my degree in counseling psychology and have been um, learning so much through that. I bet. And um, have really been surprised in the places that it's taken me so far. And I'm really excited about where we get to go with it. Mm -hmm. Um, For sure. mm -hmm. It's a huge change for you. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a leap, but like, as you said, it's something that you, you know, it kind of, all leads together it all kind of yeah. flowed together and um are you for through the time of covid and through everything happening with that do you think that's what kind of inspired you to change as far as or were you all, always thinking about i was always different... going in this direction for yeah. sure yeah. i had spent i knew that i loved working with people i knew that i wanted to connect with people that yeah. that was absolutely primary importance to me and then just after so long in the nonprofit world and feeling some of those frustrations of dealing within all of these different conflicting systems and sometimes feeling really powerless to actually do the work that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I realized that connecting with people on an individual level was my jam. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to make more of an impact on those bigger systems by starting with the individual. So right. getting into uh, therapy was um, 
sort of a natural extension of that. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about your sports background and how that's kind that of all in. correlates with mental health? Yeah. So I also was late in life as okay. an athlete. Um, I didn't. I was a very mediocre um, soccer player in high school. My coach told me I only made the team because I was a social catalyst, which, which is which amazing. But I, I, at the time, I was offended, and then now I, I really, I value that feedback because yes. I'd rather be good with people than um, at playing soccer. Mm -hmm. But definitely, like I didn't, you know, sports wasn't something that I really identified with as a kid. Right. And then always sort of ran and, you know, was fit for just to be healthy or for weight loss purposes or whatever. Yep. And then, yeah, it was about my mid to late 30s where I got really serious about running. Okay. And, um, yeah, I do trail and ultra running. And it's Which is amazing. really, really crazy places. <laughs> I bet. Um, I love doing really big distance, multi-day stuff. Um, so yeah, have you fun. traveled quite a few places then? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I run in some pretty cool places. Yeah. yeah. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. And it, what does it do for your mental health? Like what, what do you feel when you get into that space? I always say that sport is such a, the perfect metaphor for the rest of our life, because in the, the sort of microcosm of whatever our sport is, we are able to build resilience and practice those skills that then spill over to the rest of our lives. So when you are to use running as an example, you're going to have good days, you're going to have bad days, you're going to have workouts that feel amazing, you're going to have workouts that you really struggle with. Mm -hmm. You're going to go through periods of your life where you need to focus on rest and recovery. You're going to have periods of your life where you need to focus on challenging yourself and pushing yourself to the next level. And then when you get into your events, you get to your race, mm -hmm. that it, it turns into the celebration of all of the hard work that you've put in. And yet, even in those moments where you're at your peak, mm -hmm. you're going to be facing challenges and having to work through things um, in a, a ways that you never even expected. But when you have the strength behind you, mm -hmm. and I'm not just talking physical strength, right. <laughs> when you right. have the strength behind you to get through that moment, um, it just turns into this, this really beautiful celebration of who you are and what you've accomplished. And, and provides opportunities for you to give back to the world as well. You know, you're inspiring others. You can be out there connecting with other people, helping other people also, you know, rise to the challenge and, mm -hmm. and go on to do these incredible things. And and then for myself, I've really noticed how this spills over into the rest of my life where, hey, if you're used to training and doing really hard things, yep. other things don't feel as difficult. Right. Or you don't spend as much time getting wrapped up into things that don't matter. Mm -hmm. You can really focus on like, what can I control? What can't I control? What am I feeling right now? How can I get through this feeling? How can I do something, you know, that's going to make me stronger, that's going to make me healthier or a better person? Mm -hmm. And what do I need to get rid of that is not serving me? Right? Right. So these these lessons that you learn in sport spill over so beautifully into the all the other areas of your life yes and uh, that's what I love about it well and yeah. you know what I find about even just races and, and yeah. inspiring with um, just with sports in general it's it does inspire others mm -hmm. um, it's so it's a way of giving back in itself yeah. like me just watching somebody go through the the finish line I've been a part of a few races myself 10 K's and that's the highest I've done mm -hmm. so far yeah. but the energy yeah that you feel around, like it's just such a positive yeah. energy. Yeah, and it brings people together. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need. That's what we need more of. Yeah. And so many of the mental health challenges that we see today are due to a lack of connection. Yes. People are not getting out and connecting like they, like we used to. Mm -hmm. We're not interdependent on each other like we used to be. And so the more opportunities that we have to bring people together to celebrate that mm -hmm. and to practice that sense of community, the better everybody is going to be. I, I totally, yeah. 100%. So leading into that, um, you specialize in men's mental health. I do, yeah. So I, I find, and again, we were talking before about the differences between men and women in mental health mm -hmm. and how we deal with it and the things that can help and benefit us in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so how do you find sports in general can really facilitate a healthy mental living and well-being. 
Yeah. So I'll give a little bit of background on how I sort of came to the place where I found that I really enjoyed working with men um, as their therapist. Sure. So, you know, growing up, I came from this very, um, a long line of very strong men. Okay. <laughs> there is, uh, you know, a lot of very proud men. Mm-hmm didn't show a whole lot of emotion. They didn't show a whole lot of, um, you know, vulnerability. And there's very clear gender roles. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what I was used to, right? Right. Yep. And even in sport, I often would just see men, you know, as this sort of, like they were just always sort of on this different level or had this, um, they were strong, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, And then I would start working with men in my practice as a psychologist and you know that door would close and there is that instant trust Mm -hmm. or you would develop that trust with them and out comes the vulnerability out comes those emotions that they don't know what to do with and I had this I know maybe it sounds like I don't know I just had this like aha moment of like oh my goodness they are experiencing the same emotional landscape and the same things that women are but as women we just it just feels more socially acceptable for us we've been led to believe it is more socially acceptable for us to express our emotions and to connect in ways that men don't feel as free to do exactly and yet when they're given that opportunity it just is this like oh my goodness it's sort of unloading and it really uh it was it was saddening and yet inspiring to me to realize that you know, they've been holding so much in and feeling like they don't have this space, Mm -hmm. this safe space in their world to be vulnerable. Right. Where are the two places, or where's one of the biggest places that men can show emotion? In sport. That's right. On the team. Right? In the locker room. You get that goal, you celebrate. Yeah. You don't get that goal. You you can cry. Mm-hmm. Um, you know you aren't successful in a race. You can sh- you can have a breakdown. You can show that you're angry. You're angry at, at somebody on the other team, and you can show that in a way that is sort of celebrated and socially acceptable. Right. So then, sport becomes this incredible emotional outlet for men. I want men to be able to realize that they can translate that to other areas of their life, mm-hmm. and you can show that vulnerability on and off the field or on and off the ice. Right. And uh, when you do that, you become, um, you just become a better partner, a better colleague, a better friend, a better version of yourself mm-hmm. because you're no longer holding in and trying to be strong. No, that is that is a really unfair burden for anybody to have to carry. Absolutely. And completely unhealthy, yes. right? Yep. Whereas if we can get you to be... Um, acknowledging that vulnerability and asking for help when you need it and and seeking to understand the emotional experiences of people around you and validating and connecting all of those things are just going to make you a better person sports a fantastic way to practice that to uh, make that connection between hey this is what you've been doing your whole life when you play hockey Mm -hmm. let's get you doing that in your family life let's get you doing that with your colleagues and in all these other areas. Yeah. Life. How does it yeah. carry over yeah. into the rest of your life? Yeah. Yeah. And so the one side of sports though, like on teams and do you find that there is a shift in psychology as far as coaching and, you know, the ribbing of other guys, mm. or is that just kind of just part of how they communicate? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's a, so there, cause there's that side of it too. I have sons that have been in sports yeah. and it can also be, there's that side to it as well. It's a tricky one. Yes. There are some sports, some sports seem to um, cultivate it more so than others. I think maybe that locker room mentality mm-hmm. is a part of, of where that, that sort of breeding ground for what could potentially be some really toxic behaviors right? and um, some really toxic emotional abuse, physical abuse, even sexual abuse. We hear these stories, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, to sort of give like a pro and con of some of, of that culture that you can develop on a team, you can have um, a team gives you the opportunity to connect with other people, to encourage other people, to feel a part of something, to know that you belong to something. Those are all incredibly powerful mm-hmm. and very, very important aspects of well-being. Right. right? Yep. But you get that toxic sort of unchecked um 
that ribbing or that bullying or abuse or whatever we want to call it, mm-hmm. obviously that needs to stop, right? Yes. That is absolutely um, detrimental mm-hmm. to our young athletes and even to adults if they find themselves in situations like that. So I really hope that coaches and parents are setting that tone where we are understanding and accepting of everybody on the team. Yes. That we're not encouraging those hierarchies based on skill or based on, um, you know, however they're asserting their dominance, Mm -hmm. but instead that we are there to support each other and encourage each other and to feel like we belong to something and turn it into, um, you know, a real force for good instead of something that is really quite toxic. Right. Because then you hear the other side of it where somebody went through, you know, their junior high, high school, college years as a part of a team and suffered all of these abuses that they don't know what to do with them mm-hmm. as an adult. They just sort of carry it around and don't know how to express right. that pain. So how would you, how would you, um, what advice could you give to somebody that maybe did go through that and, and how could you support them through evolving into realizing it doesn't not right. all sports have to be that way right. that you can go into a positive like stay in it because it's so good for your mental right. health yeah. and it often can deter people from wanting to go back right and i hate to bring out the negative side but i have seen that yeah. about right mm-hmm. so is there ways that well i think for sports and, psychology right like for sure mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely first and foremost reach out mm-hmm don't hold that in. <laughs> right. Get help and talk to somebody about it. Talk to a professional about it. And, um, you know, even to come to a place where you can connect with other loved ones in your life about it and just say like, hey, this happened. Mm-hmm. Watch for it in that's not, you know, playing out again in other sports that maybe you're now coaching or maybe that you're now um, your children are a part of or something like that. Um, you know, I'm sort of speaking to like if you were an older athlete that right. you know, that had been through this, you're right? Yeah. So definitely reach out and, and get the help that you need because that may be um, a trauma that you really need to heal from mm-hmm. and may need professional help to do that. Um, and then I think to really actively address what did you love about that? What did you love about your sport? Mm-hmm. What did that? What are all the good things that that brought out in you? Right. When were you your strongest? and your best version of yourself. And I don't just mean like, you know, fastest or most goals scored or whatever. I mean, um, when were you, when did you feel most alive Mm -hmm. doing that? When did it make you feel full and yeah. And how can we capture that again? Right. How can we capture that sense of feeling fully alive? You do that through connecting to community, to giving back, to pushing yourself, to finding that joy in what it is that you're doing. And mm-hmm. it's so easy to lose that, right. especially as, an, you know, the older you get and all these responsibilities start piling up. And as for men in particular, you have all of these pressures of got to provide, got to, you know, be the tough guy. I, I, you know, don't take things for myself. I yes. just provide for my family or, you know, whatever, whatever pressures you're facing. Yeah. And to be the, like, like you said, with, with yourself in, you were picked in high school because of your attitude, because of mm-hmm. what you brought socially to mm-hmm. the group. And it was probably a very, I just from meeting <laughs> you, it's very positive. Mm-hmm. And to be that kind of role model, I mean, to go back into sports yeah. and bring that out in other yeah. people, it, yeah. it all rubs off, right? Yeah. It does the same thing as negative. You can make it all positive and, and people oh, will see those effects. Totally. And the impact of a good coach mm-hmm. is like, do Huge. not underestimate that. Yeah. If you have a good coach, you are very, very fortunate. Yes. Unfortunately, not every coach is good. So it's also important that as adults or as parents, we understand what good, you know, appropriate coaching behavior is. Mm-hmm. And when are our children being put under pressures or exposed to some of the, some of that sort of toxic um, stuff that can come out in sport and uh, so how no do you suggest a parent sorry no, that's a tricky one that's a hard one <laughs> that's right because really I've one. been there myself and yeah. it's like you support them as much as you can mm-hmm. that was just my my what I tried the best to do but um as far as dealing with the coach, it can be a really sticky situation because you don't want to tell them to stop. You right. don't want, like, it's a very, right. Yeah, and, and they're volunteering they're, most yeah, of the they're time. they're often volunteers. Yes. yes. That is the other really difficult thing. Yeah. And, you know, you do hear the coach's side of things where they're like, oh, these parents are, that's right. have unrealistic 
unrealistic expectations. And, you know, again, just want to remind everybody, this is a game, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, exactly. this is something that we do for fun. We are privileged. You really are privileged if you are able to um, be a part of something that organized. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not the be all end all. What's far more important is that we are, you know, happy, healthy, well, challenging ourselves, connected to other people, have all of those other pillars of mental health in place mm-hmm. is far more important than being on the team or getting those goals or whatever, not to under undermine going for those achievements. Those right. achievements can be really incredible in our lives as mm-hmm. well, right? Yeah, they feel um, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're real it's form- okay to feel good Absolutely. about it. Absolutely, and yeah. they're real formative experiences. Yes. But it's not worth doing that at the expense of your mental health. That's right. So if you're in an environment that is not supporting all of those other aspects of who you are as an athlete, mm-hmm. you're in the wrong environment. Right. And yes. something needs to change. And maybe that is the coach. And maybe that's a bigger conversation with the coach or with the club or the league or whatever, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's it can be tricky, but I think there are ways to navigate it and work together. And I think, like you said, there's the perspective of the coach, there's the perspective of the parents. I think everything comes back down to uh, communication. Yeah, yeah, and I think just the more we communicate and tell stories like this and open up mm-hmm. about um, the psychology behind it, mm-hmm. it's it really is important. So I did want to ask you now. Um, you are a registered provisional psychologist. Mm-hmm. Um, can you explain a little bit about the difference between a provisional psychologist oh, yeah. and a professional psychologist? Uh, provisional just means that I'm still working on things. So okay. I do, um, I have supervised practice. Um, okay. So it means that I do work very closely with um, my supervisor and she supports me on cases and, and yeah. stuff like that. And then there's still another big entrance exam that I'm working towards. And, right. Yeah. Just a matter of time. Yeah. I just wanted <laughs> yeah. to explain that yeah, because no, that's good. it's... Um, you must feel so proud of yourself yeah. that you've got Thank you've you. done all of this and you're working towards something so mm-hmm. amazing and you found a really great group of people to work yes. with. Yes, I right? have. I have been I have felt incredibly incredibly fortunate mm-hmm. for the way that this has all worked out. Uh, let me tell you, going back to school in your 40s is no joke. I bet. <laughs> um, but I've had lots of great support along the way and um, and you know, speaking of challenging yourself yeah. and finding those things to really um, live out your purpose in life. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I did. It was hard and it came at great sacrifice. But again, yeah. I've been running for so long, which is also hard and yes. <laughs> comes a great sacrifice. That You um, see the end goal. You see what totally. you're, what you're yeah. going towards. Yeah. So how did you go? How did you deal as a student th- through some of those difficult times mentally? Do you yeah. have any advice for anybody, that, any students? Because there's for a lot students, of people yeah. that do go back in their 40s, 50s. Right. You know, it's like, how do you how do you cope? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's anytime that we are pursuing something big, mm-hmm. whether it's in, in sport or school or at work or something like that, there's going to be times where you need to be all in. You need mm-hmm. to lean into it so hard that you're making those other sacrifices and you know, I, in when it comes to mental health and wellness and self-care and, and the wellness industry, we talk a lot about balance. Mm-hmm. But let me tell you, if you're going to go after those big experiences, those formative experiences, sometimes you need to turn that balance on its head and okay. just go all in. Right. So it's... <laughs> To be clear, it's not sustainable, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> and um, it does require sacrifice, and it requires support of, of people that love you, right? And I had that, and I'm so grateful for that. Mm-hmm. Um, it needs to be then, at some point, countered with rest and recovery, and taking time to sort of get back and reconnect with the other aspects of your life that are really important. Mm-hmm. So I finished school, you know, a little over. Yeah, a little over a year ago and um, have, I have slowed down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have taken time to reconnect with a lot of things that I really um, just enjoy doing that are just very, you know, mm-hmm. enjoyable experiences yeah. for me. Things that aren't all about work. Um, it's, you can't, I always say you can have it all, just not all at the same time. Yes, <laughs> right? so true. So sometimes you just need to go through those phases in life. That's right. And yeah. be okay with the fact that you need to take the break. You deserve a break right. after yeah. all of that hard work. And yeah. 
to come back, like you said, come back to yourself because yeah. school is, you know, learning is a lot yeah. and it's doing, it's learning something that you are obviously interested in, mm -hmm. but it's not the be all end all of your life yeah. and, and what brings you joy. And yeah. well, I mean, maybe it does, but you know what <laughs> I'm <does>. saying? Yes, <laughs> it does. It but, feels great that I am here and yes. doing this now. Yeah. Um, but you're right. It's, it's, it's just part of the journey, mm -hmm. right? It's a part of who I am and what I do. And right. And you have kids. I do. Yeah. So, so they must have been pretty proud of you as well. Yeah. Yeah. It, again, it required sacrifice from them too. Mm -hmm. I, I, when my kids were little, I was primarily home with them. I did contract work and, and some other stuff, but I did, I was the, the mom who did all of the things at home and we did lots of activities together as a family. And um, some of that had to shift. Mm -hmm. You gave yourself permission to put yourself first for I a did. while. I did. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so there's some things they didn't like about that, like uh, <laughs> the increase in responsibilities around the house. And mm -hmm. But they have learned to cook and clean and do a lot of those things that I wasn't doing anymore mm -hmm. and or that wasn't doing as much anymore. And yep. um, I hope that it sends a loud and clear message to them that like, yeah, you you go for what you want. Mm -hmm. You put in the work. You go for what you want. You be there for other people when they're doing that in their lives. And we'll do that for you when you do that in your life. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. and change. Change is constant. Change is hard. So yeah. it's it's good for kids to see yeah. that change can be done in a healthy way. Yeah. It can be done in a way that's safe and yeah. um, it just is inevitable. Yeah. Right? It is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm going to stop right here. So we've talked a little bit about men's mental health and how it relates in sports, mm -hmm. um, but I know it goes deeper than that. Um, is there anything you can share with us, like some of some of your experiences mm -hmm. just in general with men's mm -hmm. mental health and where it's going right now and ending the stigma and, and all those things? Yeah, great question. Because um, you're right, even to say, like, we're going to address men's mental health through sport that's not entirely fair because there is a, a whole lot of men that don't identify as athletes or mm -hmm. have never had those sort of athletic experiences. So what about them? Yeah. And I think that that speaks to the men's mental health crisis is what about the man that doesn't know what it means to be a man in the world or they don't have those sort of, those sort of masculine markers or those things that they present to the world or, mm -hmm. you know, so you're right. Part of men's mental health is how do we address you as, as a person, as you know, this person with this emotional landscape that I was talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, but that has all these expectations about what you should, I'm using quotation marks, mm -hmm. what you should be as a man in this world. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate that? That's a lot of pressure. It is. And especially right now with the way totally, things are going. Right. right. So I feel like so much of, of the advances that we have made as women have been much needed and very, very positive. And, you know, I do think that at least in, in our world here in Canada, I feel like we are making a lot of much needed steps towards women experiencing more equality of, of opportunity and a more equality of outcome. And this is great. This needs to continue to happen. Yes. Same goes for, you know, other minority groups or other sort of marginalized groups, right? Mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. we need to be having that shift of power so that there is better equality for everyone. So That's I right. will start by saying that is 100% the philosophy and the, the background that I'm coming from. Okay. However, what does that mean for 50% of the population that's not doesn't identify as female? Right. Right. Yes. Where do, where do they fit in? And alongside this conversation of equality and, and empowering women needs to be this conversation of, okay, what does that mean to be a man? Mm -hmm. What is your role at, as, you know, within your family and, and within the workplace and stuff? So I'll share a little story that was a real sort of turning point for me. When I first started um, working on my hours as an intern therapist, I 
was doing a lot of uh, like drop in crisis, no barrier counseling, right? Right. So we had all sorts of um, incredible. I just got to meet so many incredible people I through that experience. Yeah. And one one young man came. He loved he loved coming to therapy. Mm-hmm. It was a highlight. He had um, a history of violence and had served some time, and came to me um, to sort of continue doing some of the work that he had been doing Mm -hmm. um, when he was um, in prison. And we were talking through some challenges that he was having in his current relationship and made a comment, basically something to the effect of, I really wanted to just hit her. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's this part of me that sort of, sort of recoiled a little bit, right? Because when you've worked with women for so long who've been on the other side of domestic violence or who have, um, been in situations like that with men who are acting aggressively like that, you really feel for their experience. Yes. So to hear it from the other side and to have the opportunity to come along and say, but you didn't, mm-hmm. you didn't make that poor choice. Right. What did you do? Let's talk about that strength instead. Mm-hmm. Look at how you're turning your life around. Let's work with that. And it was such a powerful paradigm shift for me to realize that like, I just, if I can help this guy be a better partner and father, I have now made the life of that woman and children that much better. Mm -hmm. So in a way, as we're helping men, we're still empowering women and leading to better opportunities and outcomes for women and children. Yes. Everybody wins. Yeah. So instead of just silencing men Mm -hmm. and telling them to like, okay, you've had your turn, sit down, quiet. Now we give them the opportunity to be their fullest versions of themselves who are emotionally aware and socially connected and strong Mm -hmm. like like they are. And this is okay. And this is how we do this in a way that is productive and generative and, and contributing to a healthier landscape, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and not in a way that is, is toxic and abusing your power and sort of bullying behavior. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I mean, it, to teach your sons and that's where the totally. generational, because it's been for beyond, forever. I mean, yeah. men have had, we talked about that too. The pendulum was away over here mm-hmm. and, and then now it's kind of like got done a full circle yeah. around. And when do we come back to that balance? Yes. And I think once we start communication and letting them know it's okay to show their frustrations and that those little wins Mm -hmm. of, no, you didn't, you didn't do that. You thought about it, but you didn't act. Right. And thank you for telling me that you thought about it Mm -hmm. instead of holding that in. Exactly. That's right. Because how many men would maybe like have these, these thoughts or maybe have intrusive thoughts about, I mean, not just about being violent, but Mm -hmm. about lots of different things that they ignore or suppress and have these feelings that they suppress it comes out down the road in bad behavior in some other way (laughs) that that can be really harmful whether it's substance abuse or you know in their sexuality the way that they're expressing that with like bad behavior Mm -hmm. or um aggression violence against other people right bullying behavior that kind of thing so having said that there's the other side of it where women do abuse men as well Mm -hmm. and so how do you What advice can you give to a man who is maybe dealing with in a relationship where, you know, whatever they say is not okay. The person they are is is always judged or you're not enough here. You should be doing more or you're not doing enough or just so many different factors. We've all seen those relationships and women can be just as aggressive. Absolutely. But maybe in a, yeah. Yeah, in absolutely. a different way, possibly, but sometimes they can also be physically aggressive too. And because there's all these pressures on men to be the tough guy mm-hmm. or to live up to certain expectations of masculinity, if they find, if a man finds himself in that situation, can be incredibly shame-inducing. Right. I don't want to admit that. I don't want to talk about that. I'm supposed to be the man here, and 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 I'm the one that's feeling this way like that. And I mean, that is incredibly difficult Mm -hmm. and incredibly unfair burden for anybody to carry. Yes. And so, again, I would just really encourage anybody in that situation to, again, seek help Mm -hmm. um, for yourself, to 
navigate that difficult situation Mm -hmm. and then seek help for your relationship as well to address that power imbalance in the same way that we would if it was you know the inverse of that exactly that's right and that's the thing is it's it's about how do we communicate through this how do we get through this time Mm -hmm. not just quitting unless it's Mm -hmm. real abuse but Mm -hmm. um, finding ways to to navigate through that together and to know what's healthy and what is not healthy Mm -hmm. right and how do we um, create healthy boundaries so that we have healthy relationships that's right right some people don't even know what that means oh absolutely if you've never been surrounded by it it's it's like anything it's foreign to you and it's your idea of what healthy is compared to somebody else's might be a totally different story how your families were raised and um yeah i well i i love talking about men's mental health because it's um i think it like i go down the rabbit hole of mental health because of of what i'm doing and i'm very aware of of the stigma that Mm -hmm. still needs to end with men's mental health i just still don't know that it's is it moving fast enough are we Mm. seeing bigger changes coming down the road here I, I don't think it's moving fast enough no. in the sense that, I mean, look at the rates of suicide. Yes. Yeah. Men are, and, and you know, one of the biggest um, demographics of, you know, people who are committing suicide are older men. Mm-hmm. Right. 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 Often these, uh, these crises are, are, triggered by loss of relationship, loss of a job, going into retirement, injury, illness, something, something about your identity has now been shaken up. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know how to access support or you don't know how to um, build that sort of other resilience or address your emotions that are going on alongside of this crisis, a lot of men see that there's no hope. Right. And I just want to offer that absolutely there is hope Mm -hmm. and it's very very important that you reach out and and get help to get you through today and get you through the next day Mm -hmm. and if all you can think about is today then let's start there yeah and sometimes it's just as simple as admitting that you're really struggling which a lot of men don't want to do they don't want to do that's right they isolate and they shift back or they Mm -hmm. comes out in behaviors like you said addictions or yeah. Or even to have it come from a, a, a place of that's motivated by love. Right. I love the people around me and I don't want to burden them with this. Yes. I don't want to put that them on this. Yes, exactly. I like that you said yeah. that. Thank you for, yes. Yeah. I do love that side of it because oftentimes we look at the more negative side of, of suicidal thoughts and ideation and then the act of and it's a lot of times driven by love yeah. that you do feel like you're a burden or you haven't yeah. succeeded in what you should have as a man mm-hmm. or, or woman, whatever. But I, yeah, I love that you said that. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Cause yeah. that's huge. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And to get through each moment, like you said, if it's just today, it could be just the next five minutes, yeah. the next 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. What can you do? What would your be would be your suggestion if you're in that moment and you are really thinking not, but you're you're going down that mm-hmm. rabbit hole of darkness. Mm-hmm. Where do you like? What's the first thing you can say? Like, is there something that you think could really trigger them out of it? Like, I don't even know if that's the right word. <laughs> well, yeah, or not out of it, but um, yeah. So if I am working with somebody in crisis, it, mm-hmm. it, it's always about offering hope, helping okay. them discover some sort of hope and some sort of little thing. Um, so there is, you know, that that is usually a part of the bigger conversation. Mm-hmm. If you are finding that you're on your own and you're struggling with your own um, mental health or your own self-care needs, I always, and here comes my like athlete side comes yep. out again in this, but I always say like, bring it back to the very next. What's the mo- What's the simplest act of self-care that you can do bring it back to your body right always because your body's always there mm-hmm. your body is a part of you like it or or accept it or whatever yeah um you can't escape it so let's just start by taking care of that mm-hmm. because your your body your brain and your body want to survive right. they do we are hardwired for survival mm-hmm. and so let's let's start with the vessel that you're in right when was the last time you had something to drink that was 
good water. <laughs> when did you last drink water? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> when did you last eat something that nourished you? When was the last time you slept? Mm-hmm. Like really slept? What about when was the last time you had a shower? Yeah. Or like cared for yourself in some other way? And then build on that. Okay, so if we can if we can do those really, really basic self-care things, when was the last time you connected with somebody? And I mean really connected, meaningfully. Right. Not a hi, how are you? Mm-hmm. But like a call your mom kind of thing, right? Yeah. Or or connect with your partner or connect with a friend. Mm-hmm. When was the last time that you moved your body, that you got out in nature, that you like felt the sun on your skin? Some those I know those things sound simple or kind of reductionist, but those can be the first steps towards hope. Right. They really can be incredibly powerful. And if you add up enough of those little steps, your life isn't looks totally different. Completely. Right? Yes. Those are all the foundational things to those next level, next level, next level. Then you're at peak. Mm-hmm. Then you're at your peak performance. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think it's so important to to kind of frame it that way that they they may seem like little steps, but they actually are yeah. just like, it's just the way it kind of has, it yeah. progresses and um, brings you from a place of, you know, it can bring you out right. just those little things. It's it's not always, it doesn't have to be complicated. Yeah. You know, just having a shower, like you yeah. said, yeah. right? Petting your dog, right. spending time with your animals and your yeah. kids, getting outside. Like yeah. for me, I love to get outside, put my feet on the ground. Yes. And even yeah. if that's all I do that day, yeah. like if I have a down day or whatever, yeah. Get outside for a bit and just feel the air. Mm-hmm. It's a start. It is. And almost without fail, mm-hmm. that one little start turns into something else. That's right. That's the way that it's the way that we're wired. That's right? right. That's the dopamine in our brain that keeps us moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And it, sending that smile to someone when you do go out, yeah. see what comes back to you. Yeah. yeah. You know. Which those things can feel really, really overwhelming if you are surrounded by uh, dark thoughts and depression or suicidal ideation. Those things can feel really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Um, Having a drink of water, though, that's also a start. Okay. (laughs) Right? right. Do you see what I'm saying? I do, yes. Like, let's have the the simplest thing and build on that. Yeah. I like that. You always have that option. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, do you find, okay, so you work with men's mental health. Are you working with younger adults like men? Are you, how does it evolve from in the teenage years for, for guys? Mm-hmm. Are you, are you interested in working at all? With I do work with some young okay. athletes okay. Um, and provides, it, it's absolutely fascinating. I, I love it. Um, they just provide such a, a different perspective on things. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're young, you don't have the privilege of looking back on your life with all of these other things that you've learned, like that we that we earn with age, right? Right. Yeah. Um, so they with maturity. Yeah. <laughs> so they that coach's voice in their head, or that teacher, or that parent, that voice becomes a voice in their head. Mm-hmm. So think about that as a coach, or a teacher, or a parent or somebody who, an influencer in some way, Mm -hmm. think of the impact that you are having on a young mind. Right. And sometimes the work that we do in therapy is untangling that because that becomes a voice in their head. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that voice says things like, you're not good enough. You need to work harder. You're worthless. You're defined by your outcomes, not by who you are. Mm -hmm. And so when you, you sit down with them and you get a chance to really unpack all of that, it gives you the opportunity to provide that other perspective of like, no, 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 no. Yeah. Who are you? What are your values? What lights you up? What drives you? Mm-hmm. And let and stay there. Right. Like, don't forget who you are and stay connected to that really authentic place. And that's where you grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, for sure. That, that's, that can be a hard perspective to see as a, as a young adult or a young athlete. Um, well, yeah, because yeah. you're so wrapped up in your own you world. Don't know any different. You don't know any you different. You don't know any different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And if depending on your role models and who's around totally. you. And yeah. right now, again, with Instagram and I social know. media and all I that, know. like you have to be so careful yeah. what what you're going, you know, where you're leading yourself yeah. and – um, what advice you're taking. Totally. It's not always the, yeah. you know, it's the experts, the I, Instagram experts. I know. Right. I, I think it's, I don't know if you ever get the chance to do this with your kids or partner or whatever, but 
look at somebody else's Instagram algorithm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. It's going to be different than yours. Absolutely. And when you realize that you, you realize like, what is, what's feeding you Mm -hmm. and what's feeding your child or, you know, whoever else, because (laughs) that's not the bigger picture. It gets pretty, um, pretty specific or pretty, you're not getting the full picture no. from what you see on social media. Not at all. No. And there's a big old world out there with lots of different beliefs and values and ways of being and ways of living up to your potential and mm-hmm. um, well, find even, it, go out there and find that. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. I, that's, I love that advice because yeah. as, especially as a parent, yeah. you know, if your son or daughter are on social media, who are they following? Mm-hmm. Who are they, you know, like, what are they driven by? Right. Um, I think that's a great perspective. Yeah. I've only ever thought, you know, what are they saying or what are they, mm-hmm. who's commenting on their photos or what photos are they posting? You know? Um, okay. So guys in mental health as well. I know we talked a little bit about this and it's maybe not where you're um, like the body image of a, mm-hmm. a young male, especially because we're talking about social media mm-hmm how that is like, it's affecting a lot more guys than we realize too. It's not just a female problem. Right. Oh, for sure. And again, going back to um, what is your algorithm saying? Right. Remember, this isn't just who are you following? This is who are you being fed? Right. What is the image that you are being force fed out there? Right. On your little device. Look around you next time you go to the pool. (laughs) Bodies don't look like that, right? Bodies come in all kinds of of wild and beautiful shapes and sizes. And Mm -hmm. and that's the beautiful thing about being human, right? We have this incredible diversity, including with our body shape. Yes. But you don't see that on social media. No. And of course, you know, young men are drawn to that just in the way that young women are. Mm -hmm. With the same sort of like, oh man, I, you know, got to bulk up or I have to look like this or um, those pressures are real. They are real. real. And eating disorders and um, disordered body image and body dysmorphia, those affect men as well. Right. For sure. Yeah. And and how do you, what kind of signs do you think, do you know what to look for? I'm not. not um, I know that you are like specializing in I don't specialize in, in eating disorders. Okay. okay um, fair enough. But definitely, um, well, just like what I was saying about how Um, you know, the voice of the coach or whatever becomes the voice in their head. It's the same kind of thing. Like if this is what you think is normal, Mm -hmm. um, then let's take a little reality check here because it is not normal to have, you know, this perfect lean muscle mass or whatever it is that you're aspiring to. Right. Um, There's, that is like one slice of the population. And I don't want to say that those people aren't real either because they are real. There are some bodies that are very fit and they work very hard for that. Um, But that doesn't mean that that's by any means the gold standard or something that we all need to be aspiring to. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Mm -hmm. So let's pan out and take a bigger picture. So yeah, you're going to be listening for, um, you know, they may not young men may not be showing it in the same way that you might be looking for signs with young women. Um, but you will see it come out in some of those other sort of like, um, competitive or sort of jockeying behaviors or putting other people down or comparing and, um, right. Some of those sort of like, because when you judge others, you're usually judging yourself absolutely. as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's thank a mirror. You. Yeah. You're coming back at yourself. Right. And, um, and for guys, especially like I'll hear from my kids, sometimes a gym they go to or somewhere they go to work out, they feel comfortable in certain places and not in others. Mm-hmm. And it depends on kind of that, the culture within that gym, mm-hmm. you know, as far as the beefy guys, which right. again, that's great. But um, the comparing while you're there, yeah. you know, um, everybody's at a different level and every, mm-hmm. just because you lift heavy weights doesn't mean that you're more of a man than somebody else. And yeah, yeah it's, there's a lot of thing comparisons, I think. Yeah. 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 yeah so in, in sports and therapy, I think it's important to, to know it's not just about how you look, like you said Absolutely. earlier. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And it, I will also add, it's not just about how you perform either. Right. That is part of it, mm-hmm. being skilled and talented at what you do and always, you know, striving to, you know, I love the line, be the best at getting better. Yes. <laughs> like don't go. don't strive to be the best. Be Strive to be the best at getting better. Okay. I like that. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, um, 
but often sometimes we will also fall into the trap of like, you know, what's, how many goals did you get? How many, um, you know, what's your pace time or what's your, you know, your pace and your time in this race or whatever, mm -hmm. try and define ourselves by some kind of metric. How much can you bench press? Or yeah. Whatever, how many right? pushups can you do? That is also, you know, along the same lines as like, what do you look like? Th those sorts of beliefs, mm -hmm. limiting beliefs can also, um, they just can be very toxic because right. now you're defining yourself by a arbitrary metric, yes. right? Yeah. Really. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you can focus on like, be the best at getting better right. <laughs> at what you do in all aspects of your life, um, is going to be a much healthier way to have that element of challenge and productivity and, and growth mm -hmm. um, without these um, external validation and goal sort of results mm -hmm. that sometimes we way overemphasize. Oh, for right? sure. Way overemphasize way, those things. Yeah. Um, so men in the workplace, I do want to touch on this really quick. Do you have any kind of opinion or advice to men in the workplace, especially mm -hmm. like we're in Alberta. It's a very, um, you know, What's the word? <laughs> We're very, what's the word I'm trying to think? I can edit all this out. But for guys that in that are in um, an industry that maybe proceeds, perceives it as strength and uh, certain behavior, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like the, the old school kind of tough, you know, yeah. you got to do this and that. I think it's changing a bit, but I still see it. Is, does all of that kind of, like, do you work with any guys? Have you worked with anybody in that situation? Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I wish, I, I just wish that we could, I've often said, you know, when you're working in, a, you're doing therapy or in an office, you know that there's other people, other men in the offices next to you and all over on the whole floor or whatever. I wish that we could just like lower the walls and everybody could see who else is out there and who else is hurting. Mm -hmm. And I wish that we could do that in our workplaces. And I, I hope, I hope that men in some of those environments that are very uh, male dominated, that they can be looking around and seeing their colleagues as the, you know, the humans that they are, who have those same emotional landscape that they do, that have the same challenges that they do or are struggling in some way that you probably know nothing about. Right. And how do we connect with that person? Often we don't. You, often people will work beside somebody at their oil field job or whatever for years and years and years and really know very little about them. That's right. Even though they're spending all this time together and drinking beer together or doing whatever it is that they do. Mm -hmm. So I often encourage people, <laughs> encourage men, and they look at me like, are you crazy? But <laughs> I encourage them to lead with some vulnerability. Yeah. Just get real with someone. Mm-hmm. Ask them, no, how are, you, how are you really? Yeah. Right? Yeah, and you'd like, be surprised, I bet, by the responses. Yeah. yeah. Like, you're not seeming yourself today. Mm -hmm. Is everything okay? No, really. Is everything okay? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. How about that, you know, thing you were telling me about with your kids or, you know, that challenge that you're having with your partner or, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Just, take, just lead with some vulnerability. Yeah. And um, it takes courage. It takes um, some skill, mm -hmm. yep. a skill that a you'll, practice, will, yeah, right? you will get better at the more mm -hmm. you do. Um, it might take some reciprocity, meaning this is an opportunity for you to also share and mm -hmm. be real with somebody. Yeah. But what happens when we do that? We have a meaningful connection. We understand that person. We validate that person. They can understand us. They can validate us. We walk away feeling better. Mm -hmm. We're now better employees. That's right. Right. Better bosses. Yes. Right? Yeah. It's the ripple effect. Yeah. Yes. And getting better at being better. Yeah. Is that what you said? Uh, be the best at be getting better. Be the best better. at getting yeah. better. <laughs> be better at getting better. Maybe well, that, that too. That works. That works. Yeah, I liked yours better. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to stop it and then we're going to. Okay. So I ask all of my yes this one question. Um, what is the last best thing that you do every day, every night before you go to bed? Oh, I'm going to give kind of a weird answer. Okay. I love flossing. Ah, I love that. <laughs> My son would love that. He's a dental yeah, right. hygienist. <laughs> um, yeah, I really weirdly enjoy flossing. Um, I don't know. There's probably some like 
deeper philosophical meaning we could get out of that. Like I'm reflecting on my day while I floss. No, I just love having clean teeth. There you go. Yeah. And you have beautiful teeth. <laughs> Thank you. So <laughs> <laughs> must be paying off. Yeah. I don't know. But I, I love that because yeah. everybody's answer is totally different. <laughs> and it is, it's just, it be, it's a habit. It's yeah. or not a habit, but a routine. Yeah. And it makes you feel good. Yeah. It brings some closure to the day. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. No, I love it. Um, okay, is there anything else? I guess I do want to ask, and I haven't gone there yet, what are some common misconceptions about men's mental health? Ooh, good question. Um, common misconceptions. Like, I know we've touched on a lot. I just... So I think that I'll, what often ends up happening is that men will come at the urging of their partner. Okay. That happens a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm here because my wife sent me. I'm here because my husband sent me. Um, and that sort of starts things off on, you know, while I really appreciate that they are there, then my next question is always something along the lines of like, what about for you? Do right. you want to be here? Mm -hmm. Is this meaningful for you? And so I, I don't, maybe that's not a misconception, but I hope that as the stigma around accessing mental health support for men changes, that we get more and more men coming in because they it, they felt comfortable to do so in the first place. Right. So just because your partner sent you doesn't mean that you don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. Often they're like, no, I do. I really do want help or I want to, you know, change some things. Um, but why do we wait until... A crisis comes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and it's okay to take care of yourself that way. Yeah. You don't have absolutely. to look at it like, well, she said that I need therapy. Yeah. There must be There's something, something wrong horrible wrong with, with me. me. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with you. No. Not at all. In, in fact, most of the time, realizing it comes out of a place of love. Yeah. That somebody's yeah. concerned about you and that they want mm -hmm. you to be your best. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. For sure. Um, this has been so awesome. I, so much fun to talk to you. And, um, I just, if there's anything else that can you think of that you want to land, I know you talked about, okay, you are part of Emerling psychology and the bridge sports therapy. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and then you are also helping out with the race right now. With yeah. Yeah. And I, I wanted to talk about that. Yeah. I wanted sure. to talk about that because it's important and it's, you can tell it's a passion of yours. It so, is. Yeah. It's kind of my passion part. Yeah. So I'll give you the, the quick story. Um, back in 2019, a good friend of mine, her name was Amy Elaine. She um, passed away from lung cancer. She was an ultra runner, a phenomenal athlete, personal trainer, um, mother, just beautiful member of her community. She mm -hmm. just was a beautiful soul. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, we lost her to lung cancer back in 2019. In the aftermath of that, her husband, um, as sort of a part of one of her wishes, yep. um, opened a place called Amy's House. Oh, and we now nice. have two homes. Amy's House is a place for um, people who are receiving cancer treatments and need to come from out of town, right. where they can they can stay uh, for free with their families, with their pets if need be, um, to be close to uh, their treatments. Because okay. Amy was, <laughs> she was so incredible. She would actually run, um, she lived um, along the White Mud Ravine, mm -hmm, okay. and she would actually run up the ravine to her cancer treatments. Wow. <laughs> That's just the kind of person that she was. And yes. when she couldn't run, she would walk, and her husband would drive along and make sure she was OK. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Um, she just was an incredible person, but she was really struck by, you know, as she was getting her chemo treatments, mm -hmm. um, the distance that so many people had to go and the hardship that it was for so many people to drive, you know, sometimes eight hours for their treatment. That's right. right. Yep. So um, she kind of thought like, oh, I want, you know, I want to do, I want to open this home. Right. Unfortunately, she didn't get to um, see that wish fulfilled. Um, but now in her honor, we have Two houses. Anyway. Yeah, that's so amazing. So I am the race director for a run called Run On. Okay. Um, inspired by Amy because yeah. she was an ultra runner. It's beautiful. And um, it's one of our big fundraisers for Amy's house right. in the year. So it's in um, September 22nd this year. There's okay. a 5K, a 10, or 5K, and then the full course is like a marathon distance. So it's like 42 kilometers all on trail. So okay. it's not your traditional marathon. 
Um, you can do it all 42 kilometers on your own, or you can do half of that, or you can be a part of a team and, and each run 10 kilometers. So okay. we try and make it really accessible for all levels of athletes. The mm -hmm. the run, the 5K run walk is very family friendly. We have kids and oh, people I would walking love, I'd in. Love yeah, to find yeah, out yeah come on out. Yeah. It's lots of fun. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that's, and yeah, giving that's back. Kind of that's your giving back. And totally. How Good that feels. I love it. Yeah. Right. And the running community in Edmonton is absolutely phenomenal. It is. And um, we, uh, yeah, it's really a beautiful expression of just all of the good things in life. So that's, I it's love a great that. Day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it sounds, it sounds amazing. And um, yeah, this is again just being amazing. And I want everybody to know where they can find you. What, what can they expect coming up for you? And, um, you know, all of, all of the places they can find you to, to meet you and, and find out more Absolutely. about mental health. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so if you would like to, uh, you can look me up on psychology today, Janelle Schultz. Um, I practice out of a clinic downtown uh, called Emmerling Psychology. And then um, two days a week, I am at the bridge in Sherwood Park. Although um, all of those things can be done remotely if, uh, Distance is a barrier for you, so if you're interested in accessing support and you're not close to either of those places, you can always um, schedule something virtually. Mm -hmm. um, probably the best way is to go through uh, Psychology Today and find me on there. Mm -hmm. Or on emerlingpsychology.com or thebridgesportstherapy.com. Well. Okay, yeah. perfect. And Instagram, anything like that? I don't. Okay. I'm kind of private like yeah, that. that's fair. <laughs> and I like that. It's, it's yeah. a good thing. Yeah. yeah. No, I love that. Um, um, I are you familiar with Strava? It's like no. a it's like a social media for runners. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you post your run workouts. That's kind of the extent of what I okay. do on social I media. <laughs> I love that. See, and it's positive. Yeah, it, yeah it's, I love that you see. That's also the thing is you're allowed to do that. It's yeah. okay to just like yeah, that's have my your jam. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love it. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much. And you're on your way to start another day at mm -hmm. uh, work and mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah, I look forward to seeing where things go with you. And I would love to hear back from you Great. again. Yeah. So everybody check her out. She's amazing. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Janelle. Take care. Bye. Ah, well, that was another amazing episode. Thank you so much, Janelle, for joining, joining me here and sharing about men's mental health, about how there are different ways to um, support men in their mental health, for men to reach out and to heal in different ways, whether it be through sports, whether it be through art, whether it be through, um, you know, just being real, having conversations. So thank you, Janelle. Um, she's amazing. I really, I, I do recommend that you take, you know, look into um, how to get in touch with Janelle. The information that she has given us as to where to find her, I will have all the links posted on this episode and on my social medias. You can find me on Instagram at carryonwithcarry underscore podcast or on Facebook at carryonwithcarry podcast. My email is carryonwithcarrypodcast at outlook.com and you can hear the show. You can listen and give it a share and a follow. I would love your follows. And if you know somebody that can, you know, benefit from hearing some of this information and, um, you know, learning different ways to cope, please share. Um, you can follow me um, on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening and yeah, being a part of this um, hopeful community. Always my hope is that we can reach just one more person at a time.